families for the prayer. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhatrani Pashyantum, Makashchit Dukkha Bhagpavet, Kali Varshadu Parjanya, Ridhvi Sasya Shalini, Deshoyam Kshoparahitaha, Sajjana Santu Nirpaya. Thank you, Varsha. Good morning, everyone. My name is Devapriya CG, Media Coordinator of Envoja Club. I'm very happy and pleased to be here and delivering the welcome address. Envoja Club mainly focuses on enriching students for the importance of greener and environment friendly future by fun-filled games and informative sessions. Moving to my main responsibility for today's session, we have a really great presenter here who has a growing academic profile that really inspires us. I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Roshni Mary Sebastian, postdoctoral fellow, Department of Mechanical Engineering from University of Alberta, Canada, who would be sharing her career path and discuss about assessment of incendiarity of municipal solid waste. I welcome you, ma'am. To our session on behalf of the whole Christ family. I would like to welcome the backbone of our college, the visionary himself, Father John Palekura CMI, Executive Director, Christ College of Engineering. Welcome, Father. Next, Thank I would you. like to welcome. Next, I would like to welcome Father John Palekura CMI, Joint Director, Christ College of Engineering at our own civil engineer. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Even in their absence, they're always there for us, supporting us. Dr. Sajeev John, sir, our principal, and Dr. Vidi John, sir, our vice principal. I welcome you to the session. I also welcome our department head, Dr. Krishnapriya Ma'am, to the session. Our main source of energy, our faculty coordinators, Vinita ma'am and Prabhashanga sir. Welcome ma'am, welcome sir. I would like to welcome all the students and faculty participants of today's webinar. Welcome everyone. Last but not the least, the main reason for this session are Envoza club members. I welcome you guys. I hope you all enjoy the session and get benefited from it. Thank you. Thank you, Dev Priya. With pleasure, now I would like to invite Nancy Vergas, our flex coordinator, to introduce our Good morning, all. With the motive to provide a common platform for technical activities related to the environment preservation, we launched Envata Club on 13th July 2020. The Envata Club, initiated by the Department of Civil Engineering, Christ College of Engineering in Nalakuda was purely an honorary group activity of students aimed at practicing energy conservation and environment protection through technical projects. This gives a platform for the members to acquire, process, and share knowledge on the subject. The main objective of the Envota Club is to drive home the message of environmentalism in the mind of students by planning and organizing regular activities. The club focuses on solid waste disposal, helps in civic activities, helps in pollution control, tree plantation, create awareness of the conservation of the land and wetness, create seminars, lectures, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Naizi. Reverend Father John Parekara CMI, our executive director, who is the backbone of our institution and a mesmerizing person. I invite your father to deliver the presidential address. Thank you, Anli, for your uh, nice words. A very fruitful good morning to everybody. Respected Dr. Roshni Murray Sebastian, the resource person and the chief guest of the day, and respected principal, 
vice principal and our beloved joint director for the joy and our hod krishna priya miss and coordinator vinitha miss and all the faculty members of civil department and my productive creative young engineers and what tech is a club established for for the sustain for sustain uh, for the sustainment and uh, maintenance of our environment to make our globe green and to make our surroundings neat and tidy to live for and again continuous maintenance and production and really to make our environment conducive for our living to make our life to live very happily that is the purpose of envotech club and in this pandemic season is it time envotech volunteered to venture a seminar that is really the need of the time i think we should always uh think positively about the waste waste is not you know a problem but that waste can be positively utilized for the benefit of we can make a lot of energy from the waste and we can make manure and other things from and we can again make many creative things from the waste so waste management is the need of the time and our young engineers should know how to tackle this again problem that that is faced by local administration and government and the people around and we should create and cultivate a culture of managing the waste because now when we live naturally the waste will be always uh, accumulated but that is to be managed properly that is the that is the challenge and you are like ready to face this problem in a positive manner and again uh, dr sambath kumar a very competent faculty he is okay about to join and he is also present in today's uh, this workshop i think we can like, work with anushna sir okay is already okay making some research in this area so and uh, entire civil department is on on this like, project so today the session we complete we get lot of positive ideas and uh, we get a positive energy to deal with our waste that is always surrounded by and that is uh, that is a problem for us but i told you you know when we see reality is as a problem we will be frustrated and disappointed but on the other hand we should uh, see the problem as a opportunity for positive growth so thank you and what uh, members and especially the civil department for such uh, such a initiation i congratulate our uh, hod dr krishna priya and uh, the coordinator uh, uh, vinitha miss and all the faculty members and moreover our young engineers only our student community only organizes this program so and what uh, organizers and you now all leaders are to be congratulated we thank you so much we are very happy about let us have a joint together for a better uh, earth to live with and uh, with i wish you all the best and especially the resource person needs our praise and appreciation because she is uh, from a different continent now and uh, it is about to sleep but she is ready to make us uh, very much you know uh, encouraged and she want to share her knowledge with us so thank you so much madam for your okay, readiness to come with and i wish you all the best may god bless you and have a wonderful day thank you thank you father for your great message life is not measured by the number of breaths we take but by the moments that take our breath away yes we have with us one such person Dr. Roshni Mary Sebastian, who has taken our breath away, she had done her graduation in civil engineering from University of Kerala and post-graduation in environmental engineering from NIT Surat. She was awarded PhD 
and Civil Environmental Engineering from IIT Delhi and she is currently pursuing postdoctoral research fellowship Department of Mechanical Engineering University of Alberta Canada she has done numerous research projects and has got a wonderful industrial experience she is EVS Management Advisor, GNWT, Landfill Engineer, Echo Engineering, and a lot more. We are indeed grateful to have you, ma'am. Now, let us move to the most exciting session, the expert talk on assessment of incinerability of municipal solid waste. Over to you, ma'am. You may please. Uh, thank you, Anneli, for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, and can you guys sh share my, uh, see my screen? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Envotech Club, uh, for organizing this event. Uh, and I'm also grateful to uh, Reverend Father John Palekra for a wonderful introduction, and to Anli and Devpriya uh, for uh, also uh, welcoming us to the session. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, start the session, and I hope that uh, I keep it simple and interesting so that you don't doze off on a Saturday morning. Uh, so before I uh, talk a lot of technical stuff, uh, feel free to jump in uh, uh, to this uh, image. This is from Delhi. Uh, I did my PhD there, so I spent uh, at least four years there. And this is a viewpoint in Delhi, right in the middle of the city. As you can see, you can see half the city from there. Can, can anybody guess where this is or what this is? Uh, I'll take your silence for a no. So this uh, is not Kutum Minar. This is not a mountain, but this is a mountain of waste. Uh, this is the view from the Okla landfill, which is almost as tall as Kutum Minar. This is the reality of the landfills we have in our country. We have mountains of waste right in the middle of the city, and we, ha we have people living there. So if this is the reality today, and with the pandemic, the waste is not going to reduce. It's increasing every day. So what does tomorrow hold for us? This is a big question for every environmental engineer out there. Now this on the left is the Okla landfill that I uh, mentioned earlier. Although this looks small, this could easily be at least uh, 50 meters high. And this on the other hand, is a landfill in Canada. So you may think that this is the situation only in India. But no, this happens everywhere. The landfills, you are just dumping the waste. Are they landfills or just land dumps? So this is a huge problem, whether it's a developed country or a developing country. Now, just to give you a context, when I talk about waste, I'm talking about municipal solid waste here. Yeah? That is the waste that you and I generate every day from residential, institutional, or commercial areas. Now, this waste is highly heterogeneous. So the waste you see today will be very different from the waste you see tomorrow. And it's steadily increasing, especially in the cities. It changes, the composition of the waste changes with location, with season, the population, the culture of the people living there, the informal recycling happening, as well as the local legislation and enforcement. And what is integrated municipal solid waste management? This includes all technologies, practices, and processes together to achieve specific waste management goals and objectives. So in the end, we want to reduce the amount of waste being disposed. That is the ultimate goal. But how do you develop, or what determines the development of an integrated municipal solid waste management framework? That will depend upon the quantity of the waste 
as well as the characteristics of the waste. So you can adopt a multitude of techniques. The three are, you can reduce, reuse, and recycle the waste. If there's a law stating that you cannot use single-use plastics, that will reduce the amount of single-use plastics in the waste stream. So simple measures like that can reduce the waste. Then there is biological treatment. That could be composting, anaerobic digestion, or processes like that. Then there are thermal treatment techniques or waste to energy techniques. That's where incineration comes into play. And of course, landfilling. Now, these are some of the common components that you can see in your waste. So there's 100 different types of paper, plastic, rubber, leather, um, textiles, cotton. All these are combustibles, stuff that you can burn. Then there are stuff like metals, glass, uh, ceramics. These are stuff that can't burn, sand, stone, construction waste. So these are called the inert waste. Then there are the wet biodegradable waste. So the wet food waste, yard waste, leaves, flowers, such waste are the biodegradables. Now, what are the main characteristics of MSW? So one, the major thing is the composition. What is the amount of paper, plastic, metals, food waste, et cetera, present in your waste? That is the physical composition. Then. There is the physical characteristics, that is the percentage of water, the percentage of inerts, and the percentage of volatile, so the combustible matter. So these are simple physical properties of the waste, like for any other solid matter. So conventionally, there is a triangular diagram on the basis of the moisture, volatiles, and inerts, which defines a combustible zone. So if the properties of your waste makes it lie within this combustible zone, it can be burnt. This is a simple thumb rule, which is commonly followed. Then another important characteristic is its chemical composition. How much of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, etc., are there in your waste. So that is the chemical composition or the ultimate analysis. And then you have the heat content. How much energy can your waste release if it's being burned? So typically the heat content of coal is around 3000 or more kilocalorie per kilogram. Your waste, say Indian municipal solid waste has a, a, cal a calorific value of around 1200 to 1500 kilocalorie per kilogram on as received basis. That is as is without doing any treatment. And it is, as a common thumb rule said that if the calorific value is less than 1500 kilocalorie per kilogram, you cannot burn the waste for energy. So again, this is a simple thumb rule. It is not a hard and fast rule. Now what's happening in India with respect to municipal solid waste management? So until recently, land disposal, that is land dumping or land filling was a major disposal rule. So more than 90% of the waste ended up in uh, landfills, which is why we have these mountains of land, uh, landfills or waste dumps in cities like Delhi. Towards the 1980s, biological treatment like composting uh, started gaining a lot of popularity. And then there was also a little bit of interest into mass incineration or burning the waste in waste to energy plants. The first waste to energy plant was set up in Delhi in 1989. It was a state-of-the-art plant, German-built. It was an excellent technology, but the plant closed in 21 days. It's not because the technology failed us. It's because we built a plant which was not suited for Indian MSW. And the plant is still sitting there idle. And towards 2000, the first regulation uh, that regulates municipal solid waste management activities was formulated. It is called the MSW Rules Management and Handling 2000. And after 16 years, in the year 2016, the same rule was amended to solid waste management rules. Now you have to do so segregation of the waste, and you're not supposed to dump your organic waste in the landfills according to these rules. 
and only incineration of non biodegradable non recyclable combustible fraction is encouraged according to these rules so this is just some of the uh historic activities that has taken place in india with respect to msw management so uh again a bit of background story here we have the municipal solid waste generation increasing you will be surprised to know how much of waste is being generated in a city like delhi it generates more than 10000 tons on a daily basis that is every day even a city like mumbai generates more than 8000 tons of waste per day this is very very high which is higher than the amount of land you have available amount that you cannot the current infrastructure can handle and across all the economies land filling is the major disposal road and this is the condition of these land fills this one is in gohati this one is in kochi these are not properly managed and they eventually become huge environmental and public health issues at the same time we also don't have enough land to dispose of these waste so uh, i don't know how many of you know in the year 2017 or 18 one of these land dumps in delhi collapsed and two or three people who were traveling on the road succumbed to death because it collapsed the, because these are unstable waste dumps which are almost as high as kutub minar so this is the risk of our waste dumps and we don't have new landfill sites available where we can dump these waste again so what can we do so one of the better environment friendly technique is biological treatment so even in that case the fastest composting technique which is a biological treatment technique takes about 2 to 3 weeks to complete the process which is not feasible when your city is generating more than 10000 tons per day this is probably one of the reasons why thermal treatment techniques like incineration has garnered a lot of attention because it can dispose of the waste in few minutes to hours also we have higher amount of burnable fraction in our waste now so this is a time when we ask the question is waste energy an answer to our problems we don't know yet uh again let me clearly define what incineration is and why it's not combustion so combustion is actually burning burning of the waste controlled burning of the waste in excess air while incineration is complete combustion to sterile ash with minimal environmental impact this is the focus there is minimal environmental impact when you are incinerating now uh just giving a context of what is happening in asian countries uh japan has been incinerating their waste for quite a while now they have i think at least 80% of the waste is being incinerated china has been increasingly incinerating their waste i think they have a, an incineration plant in every house these days uh jokes apart uh, but it's increasing uh significantly and in india with the swachh bharat mission we see waste energy plants coming up in small cities these days so with so many plants i know that a couple of plants are being planted in kerala also um so with so many plants being commissioned and being constructed we should be asking the question what is the energy recovery potential of these plants what are the potential environmental impacts is it actually economical and how do you assess the feasibility so before going into that incineration definitely has a lot of benefits it's very fast it has a potential to recover energy it reduces the transportation cost you don't have to take your waste to uh, kilometers away to a dump site the land requirement is very less and it reduces the waste volumes by 90% at the same time it's very expensive it is highly affected by the characteristics of the waste it could if not done properly release pollutants it requires advanced machinery skilled operators and then there is the nimbi syndrome of the public not in my backyard you can dump your waste but not in my backyard that is always there with 
any waste management technique. So considering all this, is incineration feasible? So as I mentioned earlier, there is this Tanner diagram on the basis of the physical composition of the waste. And then there is the thumb rule on the basis of the calorific value. In both these cases, the energy recovery is being considered. But what about the environmental impact? Nobody is talking about that. So this is when we should actually be thinking about incinerability as a property of the MSW. But how or what is incinerability and how will we quantify it? So this was one of the main objectives of our study to find a way to quantify the incinerability of municipal solid waste easily. So within the study, we defined it as the ability of MSW to be burned completely to sterile ash with minimal environmental impact, optimal energy recovery, and economic sustainability. So as you can see, there is three E concept, environmental, energy, and economic. So this is quite complex. So in order to quantify that, we plan to develop an incinerability index or I index. And uh, as always, data availability are hu is a huge concern when it comes to waste management problems. So we incorporated a lot of expert opinion while developing it. I'll make it as simple as possible. So this is uh, the I index was developed in a couple of stages. First, we identified the goal, which was, of course, to quantify incinerability. Then we had to select the parameters. So there might be hundreds of parameters that affect incinerability. So we selected a few. Then we tried to rank these parameters, convert them into a uniform scale, and then aggregate it. Add it somehow to make our index. <coughs> In the first stage, which is a selection of parameters, we considered about 13 different properties of MSW, which could affect the incinerability, and finally landed upon eight parameters, which is the bulk density, the auxiliary fuel required, that is additional fuel requirement to burn the waste, potential carbon dioxide release, sulfur dioxide release, heat content, specific heat, volatile content, and the moisture content. Then we went to the next stage, which is the relative ranking. So there is no way or there's no possibility that all these parameters are equally important to incinerability. Some may be more important than the other. So we tried to get a relative weightage of these parameters. So we did, used a method called analytic hierarchy process, which is a multi-criteria decision-making method. And we found the relative ranking of these parameters. So potential sulfur dioxide release, heat content, carbon dioxide release, and auxiliary fuel received high weightages. So as you can see, an environmental criteria, an energy uh, recovery criteria, an economic parameter, all these received high weightages. So there's a balance in the structure of the index. Next, we considered normalization of parameters. That is, th these are eight different parameters which is expressed in completely different units. Say my waste has 30% moisture content and a calorific value of 1500 kilocalorie per kilogram. How am I going to add two different parameters which are poles apart? So we need to convert it into a uniform scale. So we went for a graphical method. So whatever be the value of the parameter, we will convert it into a uniform scale of 0 to 100 graphically. So this a lot of effort went into the development of these graphs. But the idea is, say my heat content of my waste is 1400, I get a corresponding value from this graph on a scale of 0 to 100. So I have the normalized values for all these parameters through these graphs. The final stage is aggregating these parameters. So Again, there's a lot of thought that goes into finding an aggregate function. Um, I can just add it, A plus B, or I can multiply it, or I can use these relative weightages in my addition or multiplication, or uh, there are at least 15 different functions which can be used. And we also consider the sensitivity of these functions uh, while selecting the aggregation function. 
And finally, we developed I index as sigma WIPI by sigma WI, where WI is the relative weightage and PI is the normalist value of that parameter. Using this, if you know the characteristics of municipal solid waste, you can compute the I index or the incinerability of any solid waste that you have. And we validated this uh, for a variety of uh, different, different cases. Uh, and this is one of uh, a personal favorite of mine. We considered the waste characteristics of MSW generated in more than 100 cities across India. And we tried to develop an incinerability map. Um, so, and also try to draw some parallels as to why there's this variation. So the red areas have a lower incinerability for the waste. The green areas have relatively high incinerability and the dark green areas have uh, relatively very high incinerability. So um, as you can see, the waste generated in Kerala relatively had a lower amount of uh, incinerability, probably because we have high amount of moisture content uh, because of the weather, as well as because of our food habits. Whereas uh, the waste generated in, say, uh, places with high tourism activities or foreign settlements, there was a relatively higher amount of paper and plastics, uh, which actually increased the incinerability. So places like Kashmir, Goa, uh, Pondicherry, all had relatively higher amount of uh, incinerability. Just uh, an interesting observation that uh, we had. Now, uh, again, to give you an idea of how this I index uh, was for Indian MSW, we considered the MSW for, uh, sorry, in I index for MSW generated in South Delhi, uh, which was about 66.7 on a scale of zero to 100. And from this MSW, if you are taking out the paper, uh, say, assume the paper is being recycled, it will reduce the incinerability or the I index to 63.9. That is because paper has a considerable heat content. If you're taking about the, out the plastics, it will reduce to 57.3. If you're removing all the combustibles, it will reduce to 49.7 from 66. At the same time, if you're taking out the biodegradables, that is the food and yard waste, this will increase to 75. If you are removing the inert fraction, that is the glass, the metals, the sand, the construction waste, etc., this will increase to 75. If you are removing the entire amount of food as well as the inert waste, this will increase to 84.5. This is again just a comparison. Uh, quickly, uh, we also did. Uh, that is, every research has a theoretical aspect as well as an experimental aspect. Um, I was very interested in pursuing the experimental part, so uh, which is a very simple experiment. We tried to characterize MSW generated across India through three different seasons, summer, winter, and monsoon. So we considered south, north, central, um, as well as east and west. So we had 12 different sites. So we went to the site, collected the samples, brought it to the lab. We tested it for moisture content in a hot air oven. We tested it for the elemental composition in a CHNS analyzer, the ash content and volatile content in a muffle furnace, and heat content in a warm calorimeter. Uh, these are some of the sites. Uh, there's Chandni Chowk in uh, Old Delhi. This is IIT Delhi dumping ground. Uh, this one... Uh, both these are close to IIT Delhi. This is the Okla landfill. Uh, this one is in uh, Kalamashiri in Kochi. Uh, I think this site is closed now, uh, which is a dump site. Uh, this one was in Nagpur, which is central India, close to Nidhi Nagpur. This was uh, one was in uh, Bombay. And uh, we also had two sites in Gohati. Uh, this is one of the worst managed uh, dump sites that I have seen, Boraga landfill, and this one is close to IIT Gohati uh, at Jalukbari. So uh, we conducted sampling at 12 different sites across uh, three different seasons. It was a long and tedious process, but we were able to develop uh, an exhaustive table of characteristics uh, 
four municipal solid waste components across three different seasons uh, for entire India. So this is representative for Indian MSW. We don't we didn't have such uh, representative data before. So this was quite interesting uh, work. And uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say uh, emphasize that waste management is actually a huge concern uh, across all economies. Um, and each country has different set of philosophy, depending upon their uh, available infrastructure, the waste quantity and characteristics uh, on how to manage the waste. And almost all the countries are struggling post the pandemic because of the amount of waste that's being generated. So as engineers, as environmental engineers, we all have to be aware of the technologies out there and have or think about possible solutions to tackle this problem. Uh, this was a humble attempt uh, considering the recent emerging interest uh, in waste to energy. So we just wanted to develop an easy uh, tool to quantify incinerability of municipal solid waste. So if you have a sample of waste and know its characteristics, you can simply use this tool to calculate it. Uh, so always uh, look for solutions uh, around you. There's a lot of problems to solve and uh, I hope you keep your eyes and ears open for that. And uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity and for your patience. Thank you, ma'am. It was indeed a great session. And we will now have an open session for all the participants to ask their doubts and queries to ma'am related to technical one. And those with the questions, please highlight yourself in the chat box. I see one. Okay, ma'am. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, uh, I saw one question on the major yes, setback. Uh, thank you for that question. So, um, I think it's not just in Kerala, but uh, everywhere. Uh, the main thing uh, or the key to uh, properly managing the waste is properly segregating the waste in the beginning. So, segregation of the waste. Uh, I know that at least some municipalities have. A separate bin system to do the separated collection of the wet and dry waste. But uh, I don't know how uh, efficiently it's implemented by, uh, throughout across uh, all the municipalities. So that is one major challenge that I see. But uh, having said that, I do think that uh, the situation in Kerala would be much relatively uh, better than what I've seen in uh, other parts of India, but so segregation would be a key. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, is there any more questions? Yeah, I saw one more question uh, on the heat recovery. So um, I think I missed uh, emphasizing on that point. Uh, at least in Indian context, the goal of waste to energy is not generating energy. Our priority is getting uh, the reducing the volume of the waste because we don't have space to dump this waste. The energy recovery is actually an added benefit. So I know that the at least three ways to 
two waste to energy plants are at least working in delhi right now they are not working for the energy the energy generated is being used within the plant itself if i am not wrong i don't think it's provided to the grid uh so it's actually an added benefit it's not the end goal while in uh european countries they are usually actually using it to uh it for district heating uh which is working very well for them it's not uh i don't think it's done in japan too heat recovery is not their main end goal so i see another question on uh, why we have at least a few installed incinerators not working in kerala i have not <laughs> i will not co uh, comment on uh, those incinerators specifically but to my understanding the incinerator incinerators which are not operational are mostly because it is uh, not designed to the quantity as well as the characteristics of the waste being generated uh, i had worked on one of the incinerators in madhya pradesh um they were having trouble the capacity of the plant uh, was say um 1000 tons and they were not sorry 600 tons and they were not having so much of waste so they had to look for alternative ways to actually burn to meet the daily capacity so that could be one reason but uh i do not know uh, of the specific incinerators in kerala or the specific problems that could be uh, the reason probably uh what would be the scope of the incinerator for create uh, incinerating without air pollution um so i am not sure what is being meant by the scope of the incinerator but most incinerators come with uh Uh, adequate flue gas cleaning uh, uh technologies so there is uh equipment to i think most of the working incinerators at least come with uh live monitoring of the emissions uh being made there is uh flue gas cleaning for sulfur dioxide for hcl for the particulates so there are uh fabric uh, filters uh scrubbers so most acidic gases particulate matter everything will be screened out before the flue gases is released to the atmosphere uh the fear behind uh, the incinerators is the re release of dioxins and furans which cannot be measured uh on site but the working incinerators do claim that such emissions don't happen uh we we have to take their word for that because we don't uh, at the moment have the technology to do the measurement on site that being said it's very expensive to have all this uh, infrastructure installed and if i am in no way endorsing incineration as a technique uh, i am just presenting the uh, opportunities that we have if there is an option we should always go for the waste management hierarchy that is reduce reuse recycle go for biological treatment and if nothing else works go for thermal treatment thank you ma'am I hope that's the end of the question and answer session. Yeah. With the way. Excuse me, ma'am. Actually, uh, I am Dr. Sambhat Kumar. Uh, actually, I have made one new design of an incinerator, which can I can incinerate the even the biomedical waste without sending a smoke outside. I am converting that smoke into. I am just uh, condensing that into an, a solution. Okay, with my device. so if i wanted to take up that to an uh, project implementation for this uh, msw things uh, can you please tell me what is the procedure for that uh when you say implementation implementation uh, 
uh, on a lab scale or on a yeah, yeah. municipal I have, scale? And I have tested a small prototype. It is working okay. fine. Okay. Now I wanted to make that to be implemented on a large scale. Okay. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, I would like to uh, know more about that. I can design. even share that uh, video. Of that Absolutely. Prototype. Absolutely. Um, that seems quite interesting. Um, uh, on a larger scale, um, if this is a successful uh, working model, I, I am very sure that there would be interested uh, parties to fund uh, a larger scale. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Can I just plan. wait a minute? I'll I'll share to you now. Sure. One second. If if there is any other question, you please proceed. I'll just uh, search that and I'll get back to you in a minute. Can you see? Uh, I'm seeing a blank screen now. Is it? Can you see now? Uh, I'm still seeing a blank screen. I, I don't know if it's an issue at my end. But anybody is able to see that? Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Yeah. Also, oh, my uh, actually my equipment. It will uh, this this model will observe that. Uh, what do you call your uh, the smoke? Okay, it will be absorbed and uh, it will be converted into a wastewater, so which can be disposed very easily. And this wastewater can be used for uh, bio plant, biogas plant, or anything which is being placed there. Uh, when you say absorbed, uh, uh, I will. Talking about uh, scrubbing action, I mean. Uh, no, no, that is one special arrangement I have made. Okay, ma'am, I'll do one thing, ma'am. Let us not uh, waste others' time. Also, I will. I will contact you. Uh, okay. I'll Absolutely. Contact number. Yeah. Okay. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now moving on. That's end of an acoustic session. Now moving on to an interactive session with Dr. Roshni Mary Sebastian. Uh, Ma'am, your unquenchable thirst for knowledge has really inspired us all. So, could you please share your journey from TKM Engineering College, Kollam, to University of Alberta, Canada? That's uh, I. I don't really know uh, how to define the journey. Uh, frankly, it was a lot of uh, exams, assignments, and projects and presentations, but. Uh, Jokes apart, um, it has been uh, wonderful because every time uh, while I was studying at TKM, I felt that uh, there's a lot more uh, opportunities out there. So I always try to upgrade. When I got an opportunity, I grabbed it. And uh, I had amazing mentors uh, at uh, meet at NIT or IIT. And uh, that was what kept me going. Uh, I I don't think uh, I can't find on any other way to articulate it. But if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Thank you, ma'am, for that advice. Uh, okay. Next, uh, so, ma'am, you have done your M Tech in NIT, PhD in uh, IIT, and also is currently pursuing postdoctoral fellowship in. University of Alberta. So, had you already set your goals during the tech studies? Uh, not to the scale. Uh, I wanted to pursue higher studies uh, uh, for sure. Uh, I was not sure uh, whether I'll clear the uh, exams for that. Um, but definitely, I wanted to uh, continue my studies. So, when I uh, got admission for masters, uh, I just jumped in. I did not take a gap for working, which is actually probably a drawback. Uh, I kept studying uh, and continuing the studies until now. This is when I actually started working after I finished my PhD. Okay. 
uh, ma'am so what do you to continue learning more and more like most of us will be so lazy like we go till <laughs> beat mtech only so after that we'll be like why uh, studying so much more we'll just go for a job or something like that so um, what do you yeah i think uh, one reason was actually my father uh, he was actually a researcher himself he was working at uh, ss college um and had a research lab of his own so uh, i was always inspired by that but uh, other than that i don't think uh, a lot of people will come back once you start working maybe it is a little bit harder to drop your job and then come back to academics again i personally feel that way may not be the case uh, for everybody else uh, so when i got the opportunity to continue the studies i grabbed it and uh, i don't have any regrets of uh, not doing that it has been uh, a great uh, journey so far okay ma'am okay ma'am ma'am uh, were you well determined while selecting the college and the course uh, which you studied uh yes that was uh, particular so uh, i always try to get the uh, best uh, college i could get at that point so i could not get uh, cet which was my first choice so at the uh, the time that i was uh, giving my entrance and admissions process i think tkm was the second rank so i went there i should have probably gone to gec thrissur because it was closer to home but i still chose to uh, go to tkm uh, despite the long travels and stay in the hostels and all that uh so i was adamant on uh, choosing the uh, top college that i could get as for the courses i wouldn't say uh civil was my first choice but i have no regrets because had i gone for electrical engineer or uh, engineering or any other course it would have uh, led me to a different journey altogether but if you can get into a top rank university because a lot of the institutes in india especially the iits are ranked very high in the world uh, and you may not know that uh, the universities abroad may be ranked much below say iit madras or iit delhi so uh, studying at a, a well ranked university will always count if you are sticking to your academics yes ma'am it's an indeed an inspiration for each one of us so now how did you prepare for your gate exam and ielts exams uh so uh gate was gate is actually essential if you are studying in india for masters and phd it's very crucial uh i think uh towards my third year of btech or so i started uh, uh preparing for gate uh, we did not have a lot of uh coaching opportunities back then in kollam uh so i was doing some weekly courses in kochi and then rest of the studies we did at home we also had some classes uh, in college so our faculties used to help us out uh so that's how we uh, i did it back then and for ielts it's it was not a priority for me so i did not put a lot of effort into it uh i uh I realized that it's a very difficult exam to clear after I saw a lot of my friends but uh I was I had a relatively stronger background with I used to read a lot uh so it was a little bit easier for me but I realized that if you do a lot of practice sessions online just doing online reading and listening and uh, such practice tests I think you can still clear it uh but if you are planning to study in india for masters or phd you should focus on your gate preparation right from third year at least okay ma'am so uh, you are specialized in environmental engineering field so can you share the opportunities for an environmental engineer uh environmental engineering has a lot of opportunities uh abroad as well as in india i have not uh look for uh engineering opportunities in india yet but i know that there's a lot of research opportunity you can work in water treatment waste water treatment solid waste management air quality and there's a lot of uh 
centrally funded as well as uh, uh, state funded research institutes. And I uh, know that a lot of uh, waste energy plants are coming up. So many people are looking for engineers to work on such plants, uh, whether you have experience or not. Uh, so there is definitely a lot of opportunities depending upon your area of interest. Okay, so uh, you have worked as an environmental engineer in Canada also. It's obviously a greater achievement. So what were the challenges that you faced while, while you started a career? Uh, the biggest challenge that I faced was that was uh, that's just in my case because I did not work uh, till I finished my PhD. So I was a fresher with a PhD degree. So I was overqualified but underexperienced, uh, which is not a favorable uh, situation. So, uh, but I luckily had uh, an appointment with the University of Alberta. So that helped me get a start and work on a lot of projects. So if you're planning to work in uh, a country like Canada, getting a start is difficult, but once you get a start, the sky is the limit. You will have hundreds of opportunities that come your way. So how's the working environment over there? It's very different from uh, India for me, uh, at least because uh, I was working in research while in India, and that required 100% dedication. There was uh, no work-life balance. Uh, but uh, in Canada, if I work till four, I close my laptop at four. Uh, I don't have to do any work after that. Then it's uh, my personal time. So that's the best benefit that I see about working here. I cannot talk about all the jobs, but the work that I do allows me that freedom. So uh, that's wonderful to have. That's great, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So uh, we were so surprised to know that uh, numerous research publications and conferences you have attended. So can you please share the importance of the thing? Yeah. Uh, it's actually expected if you are working uh, as a researcher, you are expected to publish. It's called publish or perish. Uh, so it's a mandatory requirement. Um, as for the benefits of it, if you have a work worth presenting, uh, you should definitely present it. You should publish it because it gives you the recognition um, that nobody can question your work after that. If it's published in an uh, accredited journal. So if you're publishing in one of the uh, Scopus journals or Web of Science journals, it gives you a lot of credibility and to your work. And as for the conference presentations, it does not give you a lot of points academically, but it gives you an opportunity to network. Uh, so if you meet the right people working in the industry or the academia, it could lead to a lot of future opportunities. Uh, so uh, presenting your work to the right people, uh, to the right uh, audience is very important. Um, I met uh, a few researchers at some of the international conferences uh, in India, which is conducted every year. There's a lot of participants from academia, from different universities across the world. So if you could present at such a forum and meet professors there, that could actually possibly lead to future collaborations. So such opportunities, if you are coming by that, you should definitely take it up. Okay, ma'am. Other than the academic projects, you have involved in many projects. So uh, can you share those experiences as well as how was that possible? Um, so that was uh, nothing that uh, I did. So if you are working with professors who uh, work on a lot of consultancy projects, say, in IITs, the professors have a lot of uh, uh, consultancy projects coming to them. It's almost equivalent to working in industry, uh, depending upon the professor you choose. So um, you get to work. If they have the projects, uh, they'll involve their students too on those projects. So you get to work with very interesting, uh, tricky engineering problems there. Uh, so uh, that's one case. and. Uh, 
as for postdoc you are expected to work on such projects it's part of your job so uh, projects come by every day you finish them as a consultant it's more as a consultant job rather than a research job but in india you get to work on a lot of projects and you also get uh, paid depending upon where you work uh, above and beyond your stipend so it's a wonderful added benefit and you also get industrial experience uh, so you all you get a um, degree masters or phd as well as you get tons of ex experience that your friends who are working in the industry will get okay ma'am so uh, it's a question that have come across like uh, you have taken your post doctoral fellowship in mechanical engineering even though civil and mechanical engineering are connected but till phd you have taken civil engineering so how did you uh, what was, what made you to go for a post doctoral fellowship in mechanical engineering um so that's a misunderstanding that everybody will have when they see it but research is highly interdisciplinary so uh, the faculty that i work with may be associated with the department of mechanical engineering but the work has a lot of environmental engineering component to it a lot of chemical engineering component to it uh i think the mechanical engineering aspect is much less compared to environmental and chemical engineering even if uh, which is one of the main reasons why if you go going to an environmental engineering job there will be many people with a degree in chemical engineering or agricultural engineering or different backgrounds coming to the same job because they are also trained in similar concepts uh so civil engineering is not a mandatory degree for such uh jobs related to environmental engineering so you should keep that in mind because there's a, there can be a lot of competition when you go out there so are the most scopes in india if we take a post doctoral fellowship in mechanical engineering uh scope so post doc uh, will give you a lot of opportunities for continuing in academia uh, in india or abroad but for sticking to the industry that is as a consultant or an, as an engineer it may not be very useful uh but i uh, i like research uh, i like doing this work so i continue this uh continue doing this yeah okay so how do you balance your work life and personal life <laughs> and i you are asking the question to the wrong person i uh, am very bad at that uh uh i still can do it because my job uh, allows it here but i used to be really really bad at it um and uh doing a phd is a lot of commitment and it's a lot of sacrifices uh so it's not possible to have that balance all the time uh but it's worth it looking back uh, it's absolutely worth it uh but if somebody has a better solution uh you can definitely give me that but i have seen many uh phd scholars who manage their family their studies uh very well uh, i am not one of them uh but it's always nice to have that balance uh otherwise you cannot continue doing the same thing for a long time okay so if i'm asking you if you could do it all over again the same process would you choose the same path for yourself absolutely <laughs> without <laughs> a doubt <laughs> okay ma'am okay then the last we are ending going to end the session so uh, very last question your growth is undeniably one of a kind and it has truly inspired us all especially as girls so do you have any kinds of tips to give us so to achieve our dreams uh i don't know uh, uh, maybe i'm not politically correct but i don't see a gender when it comes to dreams uh, be it girls or boys you should always dream uh i i don't think you should limit your dreams and passion because you are a girl or because you are a boy um 
and if your dream and passion is strong enough you will find a way to pursue it there can be a lot of challenges down the road uh but if you are really serious about sticking on and chasing your dreams you will do it you will find a way if not today then tomorrow for sure you will uh find a way yeah it's worth knowing uh so now uh, that's the end of the session with the ma'am okay now uh now we are moving on to uh, i call upon ms vinita sharon faculty coordinator of the club to hand over uh, the momento as a token of appreciation thank you ans thank you roshni ma'am thank you for the wonderful session i will just my present my screen uh, to give you a token of appreciation that was a really wonderful session uh, in spite of the bad uh, bad climate we have we got uh, enough participants and uh, i feel the my students got benefited of it so thank you so much uh, this is our a small token of appreciation our love thank you for coming Thank you so much, Nita, for organizing all this. I know that you have been behind this for a long time, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Over to you, Anne. Okay. Uh, so the feedback forms will be provided in the chat box. Do please do fill it without fail. Now I call upon Sajna Aziz for the vote of thanks. Am um, I audible? Yes, you are audible, Sasi. A warm and cherished morning to our most valued honourable chief guest, Dr. Rishni Mary Sebastian, Director Reverend Father John Palekara, Joint Director Reverend Father Joy Payapuli, Principal Dr. Sajeev John, Vice Principal V D John, H O Ds, teachers, and my dear friends. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked hard to make this event colourful. I, on behalf of Christ College of Engineering and the entire fraternity of the institute, first of all, my sincere thanks to Almighty God for making today's event a grand success. By His blessings and grace, we are able to make the event what it was. I would like to thank our chief guest, Dr. Roshni Mary Sebastian, ma'am, for taking out time from her busy schedule and enlightening us with the knowledge. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was truly inspiring and encouraging. Our sincere gratitude to our director, Father John Paliyakara, for guiding us from front for all our ventures. I also wish to express our gratitude to Joint Director Father Joy Paliyapilli for his prayerful presence on this occasion. I would like to express our special thanks to our principal, Dr. Sajeev Sir. for giving us the permission for organizing this webinar session i am immensely thankful to our beloved hod krishna priya ma'am and our faculty coordinator vinida ma'am for their support and guidance throughout i also extend my gratitude to all the coordinators and members of the envotec club last but not the least i sincerely thank each and every attendee of this session for making it a grand success again thank you all thank you sansa once again thank you so much ma'am for this amazing session uh, even despite of the time i think uh, over there it is 12 am or 1 am right it's going to be 12 but uh, yeah. i really enjoyed the session and the interactive uh, questions and everything and uh, i really appreciate the opportunity and uh, i hope you guys benefited at least a little bit from the session Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.